So everyone, welcome. Let's get ready for this. Friends, family of choice and blood and everything else. Our communities, Shuba, will you uh, uh, start the slide deck? And then I can just tell Mariana. Uh, Mariana, uh, we're not playing the video yet, Shuba. We're starting with a slide deck. Um, again, all of this showing the difficulties and the joys of multilinguality on the internet. All right, um, Mariana, you can start. I will start with a five second uh, lag so that we can trim the videos. We are live. Gracias, amiga. Welcome to everyone. My name is Anasuya in my mother's languages, which are Tamar and Malayalam, Onushua in Bangla, which is my father's language. As you can see, I come from a part of the world where I grew up with many different languages, and yet the internet doesn't feel like my childhood. Why is that? We're here to figure that out together. So welcome to the launch party of the State of the Internet's Languages. We're going to start first with the most important thing, which is for you to be able to hear us in different languages. You can choose interpretation in different languages, Bangla, Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, and of course, English. Shiba, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. So for everyone who hasn't done this before on Zoom, let us welcome you to the wonderful interpretation capability. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see that there's a little picture of a globe. Press that picture. It should offer you the different possibilities of interpretation in the languages, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Bangla, and Arabic. Please press the language you would like to listen to this event in, and please stay in that. Um, could we ask everyone to mute if they're not speaking? Um, because at the moment I can hear a little bit of noise. So just asking everyone to mute if they're not speaking. Um, and so if you press the language that you would like to hear, you should stay in that language. So that's your chosen language. It will be the smoothest experience for you to stay in your chosen language for the entirety of this event, throughout this event. And we are so grateful to our amazing interpreters who are here with us today. Um, just thank you for doing this incredible work because without you, there would be no multilinguality. So thank you for your translations and your interpretations. Um, hoping that everyone is able to use interpretation well. Um, and moving on, uh, Shiba, welcome. Benvindes, bienvenides, elan bakum, and shagoto. Um, we are going to uh, work through uh, a few organizing principles uh, in the whose knowledge world and in our family of uh, uh, practice, we use love, respect, and solidarity as our key practices. So for everyone who is here, whether you are speaking or you are enjoying listening to each other, let's bring love into the room, be your fully present multiple selves of all kinds. This is a safe space. If it is not, please let us know. Bring your love of languages on the internet and otherwise into the room and the chat box. Please show respect to yourselves, to each other and to time, um, both linear and cyclical. Uh, let us also affirm multiple lived experiences, including of course of language and the diversities of bodies and gender expressions that are in this room today with us. And finally, let's be in solidarity with each other. 
Let's be aware of privilege as we create and act together. Let us speak slowly and chat clearly so we can understand each other. And let us always express solidarity in both our language and our action. I will once again, for those who are coming in, just remind you that interpretation is available in five different languages. Uh, please choose the ones that the one that you are most comfortable in and stay in that language for the duration of the event, because that will make this event the most comfortable for you. If anyone has any trouble, please put it into the chat and our wonderful tech team, Mariana and Shuba will help you um, as you may need. Um, Shuba, the next slide, please. So given that we are doing this event for all of you who have been part of this incredible extended community that has helped us uh, do this work together, uh, we would also like you to share your thoughts on social media. So follow us and tag us. And um, uh, I, I'm listening to music already, uh, you know. That's lovely. <laughs> uh, we've launched before we launched. Uh, use our hashtags uh, in English, Portuguese, Spanish. And we are also live streaming this event to our YouTube channel. Uh, the link is in the chat. So um, do follow us and share all your thoughts on social media. So now to um, who we are. We are Whose Knowledge, Oxford Internet Institute, and the Center for Internet and Society India. We're a collaborative of three different institutions who came together to create the State of the Internet's Languages Report two and a half very, very long years ago. And we have lived through pandemic of many different kinds, uh, and we're continuing to live through pandemics of many different kinds. Half of our team um, today is still uh, with COVID, and yet we're here because we love languages, we love what um, we want to do together, and we are so grateful because beyond the three institutions are over 100 people across the world who have contributed with their love of languages their challenges on the internet through voice, through uh, visuals, through text, and in every possible way, this report could not have been made without you. I wish we could name you all uh, right now, but once we've launched, you can all go on to the site and see the incredible humans who have come together in every expression of language around the world. Uh, thank you again. Why did we choose to do language? What was this? Um, why was this so important to us? Every one of us who worked on this report is actually bilingual or multilingual from different parts of the world. And so I think for us, being people who are techies, activists, uh, lovers of language, it was very clear that even in our embodied expressions and experiences online, we were not as multilingual for ourselves as we wanted to be. And if we were not multilingual and we could not be multilingual and we are people of great relative privilege, then what about others everywhere in the world? So language felt to us like a really important research action piece to know that and to express to everybody that language is much more than a way of communicating. It's not just a technical uh, system. We express what we think, believe, and know through our languages. So to be multilingual is to honor and to affirm the full richness and textures of our many selves and our different worlds better. We cannot be all that we are online and in the real physical worlds without multilinguality. And for most of us, we understand the depth and breadth of multilinguality through music and poetry. So I just want to share a little piece, a little couplet from a language that I love from a poet called Latif Siddiqui. The poem is called Urdu. Ye payame do sati, ye ashati ka asama, fikra of fun ka ye samandar, ye zubano ka jaha. This is the language of friendship, 
the reconciliation of skies, an ocean of art and knowledge, this world of language. So what we asked and aimed for with this report, with over 7,000 spoken and signed languages in the world, how many can we fully experience online? What would a truly multilingual internet look, feel, and sound like? And so what we tried to do was to map the current status of languages on the internet, to raise the awareness of both the challenges and the opportunities in making the internet more multilingual and to advance a collective agenda for action. So that is really our aim. And what we did and continue to do, we have stories which are the deep lived experiences, embodied experiences, of different contributors from 12 different countries, every populated continent in 13 languages, both the experiences as well as the translations. Um, we have done a data analysis and visualizations of, uh, a, of a platform survey that we'll talk about a little more. Um, 11 websites, 12 Android apps, 16 iOS apps, and uh, the examples of Google Maps and Wikipedia. And then our summary weaves these stories and numbers together to create what we hope will be a community resource. This has been such a community reviewed process, a community created and shared process. Uh, all of our different communities have come together to review and to improve this resource. But of course, all the mistakes are ours as always. And finally, we want this report to be solidarity in action. And because it's work in progress, we want to make sure that you keep telling us what we can do to improve it. There will be many different uh, languages and translations that will be added to the report as we continue. What have we learned? So our panelists today are going to share all that they have experienced, or at least a thin slice of it uh, with you, and you will learn more. But most importantly for us, we want to tell you what we've learned over and above all else. That most people in the world have to use their nearest European colonial language, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, or regionally dominant language, Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic, to access the internet. So most people have to reach for a language that is not their first language. And this in the week of the Mother Language Day, the, the, the day that is launching the Decade of Indigenous Languages, most people are reaching for the internet and coming online and contributing online if they can in their second, third, fourth, fifth languages. And even off that, those languages, only about 500 of our 7,000 plus languages are represented online. So power and privilege are intrinsic to our lived experiences of multilinguality or the lack of multilinguality on the internet as with so many other things, tech. Continuing on, we're going to um, do today's event going deep into our lived language experiences in a panel on stories and context. Then we'll go broad with some of the patterns we're seeing in a panel on numbers and patterns. And then we'll do a little space to imagine our actions together at the end in our calls to action session. We're also, as you can see, trying to embody with all the complexities and messiness of it all, multilinguality in this event itself. So the event will be moderated in three different languages. Claudia will moderate her panel in Spanish. I will moderate my panel in English and Adeli will hold us together at the end in Portuguese. And now the moment you've been waiting for. Relatório do Estado dos Idiomas da Internet. Informe sobre o estado das línguas na internet. Inxuenis, gás de lixurasca, lulvacante, chaijio. 
The state of the internet's languages. In particular, we have been considering how indigenous peoples from across and beyond Turtle Island, colonially called Canada, the United States, Informe sobre el estado de las lenguas en Internet. The state of the Internet's languages. Thank you so much, Shiva, for that. So, friends, here we are. This is the site that you can all go to now. And as you do that, we want to do a collective welcoming of the report of our actions together, of our hopes and aspirations for a multilingual internet. So I'm going to ask you to join me in this exercise. We're going to, with your permission, take screenshots as we do this. So for those of you who don't want to be in a screenshot, please don't put on your video. But I invite you to think of the word welcome in your language. So think of the word welcome in your chosen language some of you who are multilingual have, may have to choose one or do all of them together and put on your mics, put on your audio, put on your mics, put on your audio, put on your video, sorry, put on your video. Let's <laughs> look at each other and let's say welcome together. Welcome, Shagoto. Welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Shukran Dhanubad. Gracias, obrigada. Thank you. And now over to Claudia. Amiga, over to you. Claudia will be speaking in Spanish to walk us through the stories and context of our report. Gracias por esa hermosa bienvenida. Thank you for this most wonderful welcome. Welcome to everyone that is that are here in this event. We are going to begin with the first panel. Could you share the slides, please? so that we can begin with the presentation. We would like to present who the panelists are for this session. We will be talking about one of the pillars of the inform on the state of the languages on the internet, which are the stories. This panel has the contributions that reflect the reality experienced by different people in different communities around the world. These are people that look for information on internet in their own language. To begin this panel, I will ask all of those who have questions to just drop them on the chat box so that we can read them and ask them at the end of the session. I will be asking also uh, the panelists to speak slowly to facilitate interpretation. Each panelist will have four minutes to respond to each one of the questions. And I will be letting them know that they are reaching the end of their participation. So I will begin with Anna. Anna is an anthropologist, and she is from the uh, mountain in Oaxaca, Mexico, and she's interested in the intersection between language and culture. With us, Claudia Soraya, she's a researcher, she's from Italy, and she works on the use of the technological medium for the protection and the appreciation of the linguistic variety. Ishan Chakraborty is also with us from Kolkata, India. He is an assistant professor at the English department for the University of Kanapur, where he's also doing a PhD. And 
we also have Yoshia Pasca Darmawan with us. He is from Indonesia, where he works for the Center of the Digital Society, and he is interested in researching on the use of social media by the activists. This is a wonderful panel, and we will begin now. We will begin with Anna. Anna, you've experienced the challenges to have internet speaking different languages. Please tell us about the most important challenges that you have faced when you try to access to information and knowledge in your own language on internet. And just remember that you will be speaking in Spanish. Just a clarification, thank you. Good morning, everyone from Mexico. I am greeting you and I'm going to use my original language. She's expressing herself in Zapotec, which is her mother tongue. I am Ana Alonso, I'm from Mexico. I am a Zapotec woman from the Northern mountain chains of Oaxaca and I speak Zapotec. I would like to speak of three things. One, before we started with this project, it was very complicated to see a document or to be able to find a resource on the net that is in Zapotec. We can see a little bit of my language reading and spoken. And this is something that we'll find for this report today. So one of the main difficulties for us, for the Zapotec people, is that when we do a research in our own language, if I choose to use Zapotec to do a research, on, on the browsers, I'm not going to find anything at all. I won't be able to find the information that I'm looking for, for in a language that I can better understand. So this is one of the challenges that we face. And with that, we see another problem. When we try to use our language to write on the different platforms so that we're able to find information, the first thing that comes out is that the, uh, the keyboard is going to try to autocorrect our spelling and they will try to match it up with another language whatever recognize an existing language and internet. So we have to constantly correct and we have to write it over and over and over so that the system understands what we're trying to say. And it is so hard to find just a little bit of information in our own language, something that we can see, we can hear, we can understand. Our language is not represented on the web. We do not have developers that would be trying to open their sources and their codes for other people, other Zapotec people from wherever in the world, because there are all other people, Zapotec people in other parts of the world so that they could contribute to the development of and recognition of our language on the net. So these are the three main challenges that we have faced on the use of internet with the Zapotec language. Yesterday, there was a buzz on that said, internet is not a multilingual space. I was uh, watching the news yesterday and I heard that there was a developer in Mexico that launched 
a topography that could be used for the uh, different languages in Mexico. I think this is a first example. And one of the things that we found on the report is that if we are going to do something or create this sort of typography for other languages, we should make sure that these are translated, that the, the terms of use would be translated to the target language. In this case, one of the things that I see with the typography is that the terms of use are written down in English and most of us in Mexico are bilingual Spanish and an indigenous language. So it would have been better or that these terms of use or conditions of use would be in Spanish for us to use them instead of English, which would be uh, yet another language that we would have to, um, uh, to use. Susana, your time is up. So, okay, we're going to pass it on to somebody else. But just a feedback before doing that. The keyboard has to, is always insisting on correcting the, the, the way we write or the way we type on when we try to use a different language. And we know that there is, there are some predominant languages on the net. Claudia, from your experience, which can you tell us about the challenges that you've faced when you try to access information on your own language, on the internet? Okay, sure. Claudia, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We will be using English. Yep. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, just to want to since we are we are here celebrating the diversity of languages and I'd, I'd just like to greet you also in my own language which is Italian so benvenuti e grazie per avermi invitato okay so I, I'd like I, I fully agree what what um, Anna was saying before um, and I'd like to comment briefly on the, on the sentence I've heard at the beginning of this panel, how many languages can we fully experience online? And the, the crucial word here is what the meaning that we can attribute to this fully. So what does fully mean? Um, we see many languages represented on the internet although not all of them, of course, but how many of those languages are actually heard? How many of those languages are actually used on the internet? And here we go back to your question. Um, what are the challenges? Um, I think, well, Italian, my, my, my mother language uh, is a language that is uh, quite uh, uh, fairly supported um, technologically. And so when using the internet, we don't experience many problems or limitations. But the most significant challenge I think there is uh, out there in accessing information and knowledge uh, if you are not a speaker of one of the the main of the major languages that you were mentioning before, uh, is what um, is called and I call digital diglossia. So that means that you have to change the language when you um, enter the space of internet where you are approaching a, a digital tool, and this happen, uh, happens in many many cases. And as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a techie, but I work with language technologies and uh, I've been involved in several initiatives for promoting the use of language technologies uh, for uh, minority or regional languages. And for instance, one, one of the most uh, striking examples is uh, voice assistance. So nowadays we are um, more and more used to uh, interact with uh, machines and devices uh, through voice. And if you take Siri, for instance, or Alexa, whatever. And uh, this is not possible if you don't speak uh, one of the major languages. 
And it is very strange for a person. It's very, very strange experience to have to switch the language if you want to make use of those devices. So it's very alienating to, uh, to have to change in your house when you are in your, in your household, in your home, to have to change a language and talk uh, in something very different, very distant from you uh, when, if, if you want to interact with those devices. So um, again, similar thing is um, the experience of browsing the web because um, interfaces, web interfaces are not available for uh, all languages, not even for many languages. So there are some adaptations, but in general, what happens is, is that if you want to achieve a certain level of technological development, if you want to make use of what is the latest up-to-date um, products, then you have to choose to adhere, to conform to one of the, of the major languages, the colonial languages or the uh, dominant languages around the world. For us, for instance, in Europe, it is English. And, uh, and again, it's, it, it's also a matter of quality. So only the privileged ones, only the educated ones will have this possibility. And this has to be changed, it must, to be, it must be changed uh, in order, and uh, so as it, it will be possible, it has mm -hmm. to be possible for all speakers, for all languages to use that, that technology if they want to. Mm -hmm. Ese es un punto muy importante, por eso es tan That's necessary. a very important point. That is why it is so necessary to so continuously uh, bring to mind the realities of different communities and different speakers throughout the world. Thank you so much, Claudia, for this intervention. I will now give the floor to Ishan. Ishan, as a queer person with a visual disability, born and raised in Calcutta, please tell us what is your reality and uh, what are the challenges that you are facing when uh, looking for information, having to access information knowledge in your language on the internet. Ishan will be with us in... Namaskar. Uh, Hello, Ishan. Namaskar to my name is Ishan Chakraborty. And I think you can hear me clearly. At first, I'd like to thank uh, this project. Uh, I think this is a fantastic project that has been initiated and thanks to which I'm able to uh, reach out to you. I'm speaking to you in Bangla and I'll be talking about Bangla and I, I'm really, I feel very, very proud. Uh, therefore, it was 21st February, which was the International uh, Mother Tongue Day. And it's really a wonderful opportunity that I'm able to talk to you in my mother tongue. And my voice is reaching out to the different parts of the globe. And I'm being able to talk to you in, in Bangla. So it's really a matter of great pride for, uh, for me. And, and probably I've been wondering that since I'm speaking in Bangla, and uh, how much presence of Bangla you have uh, on the internet then then what would be the new things that I would like to share with me? I think I'll uh, share my personal experience here. Uh, as you can see that uh, I'm challenged. I mean, I'm not able to see and uh, I have certain disability. And I'm, I also identify myself as a queer person as well. So when I, when I say that I'm queer and also I have a disability uh, that I'm unable to see, when I approach people where I did not get anything uh, intersection, I, I position myself at the intersection of queer and also visually challenged. When I checked in Bangla, I didn't say get much, but when I checked on internet in English, then there I found a, a huge amount of information, a lot of articles and academic articles that too also I find. But when I checked in Bangla, I didn't find anything. The kind of result that I had in Bangla regarding queer or the queer groups or disability 
there are people who are suggesting how do you come out of homosexuality how do you get out of this all kind of you know these kind of results uh, i found but i did not really find an intersection between queer and who, who also has the uh, uh, disability that i did not find and what would be the voice of a person like me that i didn't find anything of that sort on the internet ever the crypt theory uh, has gone so ahead and it is rather unfortunate there hasn't been much research in, in bangla and which is virtually not in existence even the uh, word queer uh, there is no equivalent, uh, there is no synonym in Bangla and queer. That's why, though I'm speaking in Bangla to all of you, but I'm using queer because you probably have understood by now that uh, uh, that all these uh, words that we have in Bangla, which are kind of uh, synonyms and equivalents of queer, they don't really stand for queer. Queer is a spectrum. Spectrum uh, means uh, a rainbow spectrum I use because uh, because it covers various identities, people of different sexuality and different disability uh, come together and there hasn't been much discussion about these topics in Bangla and on the world of uh, internet, it's really very, very limited. Usually within the community itself, uh, there are a few webinars and seminars which are being organized, but uh, it doesn't really reach out to that extent at the international level or the global level or the internet level, which is hardly existent. For that, there are two difficulties. First of all, I have lots of friends, known people who are who suffer from disability of various kinds, and uh, they use Bangla and, uh, and also from the queer group. But within that community, they also have a problem in connecting with the rest of the members of the community because they don't know any other language other than Bangla. So they don't know other languages as well. So, so being conscious to be aware and make people aware of this thing has become a shortcoming. And what you need to have is a knowledge creation so that people are aware of their rights so that the knowledge can be spread and shared. The language is the only tool which can be used to spread the knowledge around. But what you see that in Bangla, it's uh, it's not really existing. It's not there. On one hand, uh, there are no uh, equivalents in Bangla. When I'm searching in Bangla, queer and about uh, disability, what I'm getting is very confusing. Some words and statements, some uh, erroneous statements and words, as as the result, of which are misleading me. Uh, which will be misleading me further. Which will create a confusion in my mind. So in that context, what would be our position and how all different types of people, those who are able to use their language on the Internet, they have their own identity and their their worldview can be uh, cannot be shared because they are not comfortable on the Internet. And it is true that wherever Bengali is speaking, Bangla is speaking in West Bengal and also in Bangladesh, mainly in two regions the socio-economic and the political context also is not favorable. Uh, that safe space that uh, we haven't found yet within our own uh, framework so that there should be an identity through intersection so that we, we can discuss about all these pro problems openly. Today, I am I'm uh, I am a marginalized uh, identity. In fact, I have several marginalized identities. I have disability. I am queer as well. But I am really in a, uh, a privileged condition of the society. Uh, I, I belong to a high caste. Uh, I'm a male. And so therefore, I can identify myself with some of the privilege of the society. And financially, uh, I'm quite solvent. Uh, I can earn my living. I, I know English. I can access English, though I'm not able to uh, express myself in, in Bangla, in the internet, but I, I can use English. But there are so many friends 
who, who cannot do that uh, i can i can uh, search the internet about learn about crypt theory about queer and all so though i am in a privilege i say it is my duty so, so that we need to we need to i i am really suffering from this anxiety and which i really i wanted to share with you so i think it's my duty that that I should be able to say, share my experience with you. I would like internet to speak my language so that, so that I can share my experience with me. Do I see these things reflecting in the internet? No, it is not happening. So I think it's my duty that I would create further knowledge and especially something which is not there when STL has given me this opportunity so that I can create knowledge in my own language. And that's what I tried through my article. I'd like to thank once again the, the hosts. I know my time is limited. I think Flavia will come. So I'm thanking once again all the hosts and I'm my gratitude uh, to uh, those who have launched uh, uh, this report. Uh, and so that I'm able to speak to in Bangla. And I'm, I am really finding myself in a safe space. I'm going to use that. I feel peace in my mind. Thank you. That has been deeply valuable. Thank you so much for sharing your words with us. It has truly been moving listening to you. I am a very glad to have been able to share this space with you. And I am certain that all other participants are also thankful uh, for having heard you speak. Continuing along the same lines of reasoning in terms of the type of content we can find on the internet, in our own languages, because now it is not not, not about uh, doing a sort of mechanical translation. It is about localization. It is about contents that truly reflect who we are, who we, where we're coming from, and what is our place in the world. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Yosa Pasca. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity grown in Indonesia with, a li with limited access uh, to uh, information. Pascal, please tell us what have the challenges you have faced when looking for information on the internet and for our interpreters. Pascal will be speaking in English. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, my name is Joshua Pascal. I'm from Indonesia and I identify as queer and non-binary and very similar to Ishan's experience as someone um, queer, as someone who identifies and as non-binary, it has been very difficult for me to find stories, positive articles, educational articles related to LGBTQIA plus and gender and sexual minorities in Baza, Indonesia. I remember when I was a teenager, my English was very limited. I was not as good as I am right now. I was not able to understand articles in English. I was not able to read articles in English. I had to rely on dictionaries because at that time I was not aware of Google Translate. Um, and I had to rely on the internet to find information about my identity about my preferences, about my orientation. And I was struggling with that because every time I'm trying to find information related to who I am, related to my identity, I was not able to find it. Whenever I typed in homosexuality in Bahasa Indonesia or queer or LGBT, all the results that come up are articles and other types of contents that speak against LGBTQIA+. So every time I try to find some answers to all the questions that I had, 
as a teenager, as someone who struggled with my identity. The results that I found was something that further brought me down as an individual. The results that I found didn't justify my existence, didn't justify my identities, didn't embrace who I was, who I am. So it was a very challenging um, period of my life. And fast forward to now, I am privileged enough to be able to communicate, to understand content in English. But when I look at the internet, when I try to find LGBTQIA plus content, queer content on the internet, when I type in some queries into the search engine, I still find the same old negative condemning contents, condemning search results. And it is such a shame because in the Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesians is actually a regionally dominant language. A lot of people speak it. Um, 200 plus people actually speak Indonesians. But we can see that the knowledge production on LGBTQI content is still very limited. Whenever I type in queer or LGBT, those positive contents that come up come from the Western hemisphere. Most of them are in English. And as someone who is privileged enough to be able to understand English, it's easy for me to find something, to find the answer to all of my questions. But for those people who are not able to speak in English, I can only imagine how devastating it must be for them to try to find an answer to their questions, to, to try to find a content that would affirm their identity, but they were not able to. But instead, they find many, many contents that try to condemn them, that try to reject them, that try to shame them for who they are. And when they find some useful, positive educational content, they're not able to understand it because it's in English and they're not able to understand English. As a result, many people, many queer individuals, LGBT individuals in Indonesia are still struggling with their identity. They still cannot accept who they are. They still want to convert to heterosexuality. They still want to go back to their cis gender identity. So I think it's very important to create to produce knowledge in many languages, not only in Indonesia, in native languages, indigenous languages, because not many people are privileged enough to be able to speak multiple languages. And there are also those people who are marginalized, who, are already, who already belong to a marginalized group, who need a variety of contents, who need a localized content created by people in the community, people in the country, in the society, in the culture, and content were created for those people who speak the language, who live the culture, who experience these different norms and values and experiences that do not compatible, they are not compatible, that do not match with some Western perspectives or with some, you know, ideas that come from the uh, Western hemisphere or with articles or contents that are in the colonial languages. Muchas gracias, Pasca, eh, por esas palabras. Thank you so much, Pasca, for, for words. Clearly, it is uh, an enormous challenge feeling welcome on the internet if the language if the internet does not speak your language depending on where you're from and it is clearly a relevant point in this conversation and having started to unravel the challenges that we're facing when looking for information in our languages on the internet 
I would like to give the floor to our panelists to imagine what are the two main things you would like to see in a multilingual internet. Let us try to imagine a future in which the internet speaks many languages and becomes a space that is more um, welcoming for all. I would like to begin with Anna. Anna, please tell us which would be the two things you'd like to see in a multilingual internet. Anna will be speaking to us in Spanish. Thank you, Claudia. To fight uh, systematic exclusion, racism, discrimination, or this idea of uh, trying to eliminate indigenous languages, I would like to see an internet in which languages can be included in all existing formats. With this, I mean that that languages that have a written form should be included, as well as those languages that do not yet have a standardized writing system, but that could be included orally or through their mnemonic tradition. This is another important challenge to the web. Many languages are disappearing without uh, allowing for their documentation. So I would like to see an internet where us as users can uh, go to repository to open libraries of audio recordings where we could have access to other languages. I believe that could be a way to document and preserve knowledge before uh, these languages can be written down and documented. I would also like to see an internet where every speaker could uh, do a search in their own language and when and where it is possible to find information in the language that is closer to their hearts, to their day-to-day -day lives. Finally, I would like to see that all speakers of the languages that have become uh, minority, uh, minority languages in the place where they are spoken can regain the number of speakers they had, they might have had at some point, and that they could be, uh, they could also become agents of creation in the internet, as well as uh, create software creators, and to and for them to get the message that they they can participate in the construction of a multilingual internet. Thank you so much, Anna. That is a very powerful message that uh, all of us can build together the internet that we want. Thank you very much for that. Claudia, I will now give you the floor for you to tell us which are the three main um, aspects you would like to see in a multilingual internet. Claudia will be speaking in English. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I will, uh, I will echo what uh, Anna said mostly. And um, for me, uh, I think it will be essential to um, push the boundaries of language technologies so as to be able to develop machine translation that is fully integrated and easily integrated, for instance, with websites and other applications. Um, machine translation has an enormous potential and also has enormous problems. But um, being able for a person to reach a global audience while using his or her own language is fundamental. Also, um, for the language to earn respect, to be, to be visible to the outside world. And machine translation can achieve that. Of course, the quality is not enough and not equal across all languages because of many, many, many factors that in the end amount to the availability of economic power again, but it's not impossible. And uh, uh, I see over the years, I've, I, I've seen myself changing the approach. I 
have to use English almost every day in my professional life. And in the past, I used to uh, write or immediately into English, in an imperfect form of English, of course, because um, for me, the translation process was too long. While now I do um, something completely different, I often start writing a report in Italian, and then I use uh, um, machine translation to, um, to help myself with the first translation that I can edit afterwards. Of course, this is not magic, and uh, it cannot be done without the help of human translators, but it can enormously speed up the process. And especially from the point of view of the availability of content in other languages. Imagine I was listening to the stories before, the stories uh, um, told by Pascal. Imagine the amount of um, knowledge and information that was not accessible because it was in English. If it, could have been made accessible because of automatic machine translation. So that's that's first. And uh, second, uh, which is of course related, uh, language technology is available in all languages. And as I was saying, is not without, um, there are major, major difficulties, of course, in achieving that. It's not that simple because moreover, the current uh, ways in which these technologies are developed um, have a bottleneck that is the availability of good quality data and good quality data are not available for, for all languages. And also the computing power needed to train the models, the statistical models that allow to perform so well for certain machine translations programs is not available, is only available uh, mm -hmm. to, to a few <laughs> institutions, to a few people in certain parts of the world. Uh -huh. But again, this I hope that this can be changed in the future. Gracias, Claudia. Muy importante empujar eh, las barreras ¿no? y agrandar ese, ese espacio en el que podemos incidir. It's important to uh, push the boundaries and to expand our path. Ishan, you have the floor now. Could you please let us know the two main things that you would like to see on an internet that is fully multilingual? Could you please repeat the question? Sí, cuéntanos. Of course. Please let us know what are the two things that you would like to see on a fully multilingual internet. Ishan, puedes escucharnos? So, uh, two things that I'd like to see uh, completely multilingual in internet. Uh, so, my personal experience is uh, my identity. So, uh, so a lot of discussions going on about my identity. Uh, so, uh, we are discussing uh, discussing about um, uh, various languages. Uh, so, uh, we are talking about intersection. It uh, uh, cannot be from one side. Uh, this is. Uh, in various levels uh, so uh, so now we have class uh, uh, sex uh, ability disability uh, so all uh, these identities that we have uh, so how uh, the intersection can work uh, how the power works here uh, in the society so i would like to see uh, a diverse discussion about this uh, on the internet and another thing i'd like to add uh, to this is that uh, so uh, today we are not in uh, that uh, position that we can express our uh, views uh, in our language so uh, but i would say that we need to create that uh, position uh, and how via translation, via interpretation. So we have a lot of things in the, on the internet. So 
uh, we need to translate that into Bengali uh, and in our languages. And I don't think that is very difficult. That is that can be easily done. So I do not think a separate space is required for that. But uh, through that, I think uh, that uh, we can create more safe space. So if we uh, come by a different road, route. Uh, so I think a uh, uh, lot of other people, uh, they can see uh, that their views, their uh, language on the internet. So they will feel empowered and they will feel themselves very, very empowered that yes, uh, they can uh, express their views in their languages. So that is what uh, I need. And it should be multilingual, my identity. There are a lot of other people uh, so it should be uh, multilingual and it should be awareness and sensitivity. So these are the things that we want via internet. Thank you. Gracias, Ishan. Um, muy importante. ¿no? Thank you so much. I think you've uh, made a very important point to be able to find an empowering internet. Thank you so much for your reflection. Election. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Pasca, Joshia Pasca. Pasca, could you tell us the two main things that you would like to see on a fully multilingual internet? What would you like to see on that fully multilingual internet? Two things. Thank you. I think the previous panelists have summed up really well what I want to see in a fully multilingual internet. Um, but if I can propose two things that I really want to see. The first one is that I want to see an internet where marginalized groups such as the LGBTQIA community, such as the indigenous um, groups can easily find content and articles that really affirm and support them where an internet where they can discuss openly about their issues with each other, about their livelihood, about the challenges, the happiness of being in the group, of having that identity, an internet where they can educate each other, where they can share their experience with each other, an internet where they can change the current harmful narrative about their community so that they can move forward and they can develop each other and they can develop their community. I also want an internet where the online conversation can include and can promote the voices of these marginalized groups so that the conversation and the policies and other outcomes from that conversation can consider the opinion, the lived experience of these communities. And lastly, I want people to be able to speak, to converse, to communicate, to express themselves in their own languages. I think with the development of technology right now, it is possible for the internet to translate, to interpret each other's languages so that we can just communicate with each other in our own language without having to learn some colonial language, for example, just so we can connect, just so we can converse with other people. So that, just so we can access greater, broader knowledge on the internet. That's what I want to see in a, multi, in a fully multilingual internet where people can just comfortably use their own language and where people can access content in, what, in whatever languages they want. Thank you. Mil gracias, Pasca, por esas reflexiones. Pasca, your reflection is so important. Thank you so much. You've spoken about the different stories that we build up on internet and how internet can contribute to having a, an identity reflected, fully recognized, uh, to have a safe space on internet, thank you for putting that topic on the table. That is so important. We are going to close this panel. Before that, I want to uh, yield the, the, the floor to Claudia because there is a question for her. 
the question is that there are issues with the term dialetti in Italian, even though the fact that there is not enough space for the other different dialects in Italy, most of the uh, dialetti in uh, danger pose a big problem. What is your reaction to that question, Claudia? Yes, I had uh, seen the question and also replied uh, in a private message, but uh, I, I agree. In Italy, we have uh, um, a huge diversity, well, relatively huge for the size of Italy, of course. Uh, although Italy is perceived as a monolingual country with only Italian spoken, in reality, there is a um, a big variety of languages. Most of these languages are endangered, but they are wrongly called dialetti dialects, um, as if they were um, they, um, variation of the standard language. In fact, they are not. They are languages, independent languages that have evolved from Latin on a par with uh, a standard Italian. Uh, the political stance has uh, acted in a way that had repressed these languages. And uh, at the moment, they are in a very uh, bad state uh, as uh, for, what, for what their vitality is concerned. The problem is that they're not enough represented, they are not enough protected. And this, of course, has uh, extremely harsh consequences for the, for the vitality, for the prospects of uh, uh, in the future. So I agree with this with this comment. Thank you for pointing this out. I was not uh, sure that people could uh, have this knowledge of the particular situation of Italy. So thank you for pointing this out. Muchas gracias por, por... Well, thank you for the response, Claudia and for sharing your thoughts and for clarifying on the uh, situation of the different languages in Italy. We're closing up this uh, panel. Thank you so much, Anna, Claudia, Ishan, and Pasca. That, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. For giving your time, your space, for giving your thoughts and for helping on building this report. Thank you for talking about your own reality and your own experiences who have been really uh, useful. They have taught us so much as uh, organizers of these reports, but I am sure that it will be very useful uh, very, uh, very useful for all of those who will be reading this report. I think it is important to be able to talk about a multilingual internet and to talk about the current reality of those people who are not represented or reflected on internet. So your participation was paramount for this report. Thank you for walking this path with us. Having said that, we are closing up this panel and we are going to move on to uh, the next uh, panel. Thank you so much for sharing information. And we are moving on to the numbers and patterns section. I am yielding the floor to Anna Suya, who will be speaking in English. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you, Anna, Claudia Soria, Pasca and Ishan for the incredibly deep intersectional experiences you brought to bear upon our understanding of a truly multilingual internet. And hearing the stories of languages that are endangered in Italy in some ways is a really good way for us to think about the levels of languages that are not understood and treasured across the world right now. And to remind us that those of us who are multilingual, who are speaking in languages that are not colonial languages, that are not dominant languages, we are the majority of the world. We are the minoritized majority of the world. And so with that, I'm going to uh, very joyfully and gratefully introduce you to our next panel. 
um, and my friends are going to join me in talking through some of the big picture numbers and patterns that we saw through our report. So we have with us Sneha who, um, and Martin, who were both part of our core team and have been thinking, dreaming, and doing this report for us, with us for over two and a half years now. And um, they are, of course, from um, the Center for Internet and Society. Sneha is uh, a researcher and lead at the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India. And Martin is a digital geographer and data scientist who was at the Oxford Internet Institute while doing this research. So welcome to both Sneha and Martin. And then our friends who uh, really have held this report with us in different ways. Mandana is a linguist who has, I have to say, taught us more about languages in these last two and a half years than I could ever have imagined knowing. And um, she heads the Endangered Languages Documentation and Archive uh, Program at Berlin's Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. And finally, last but not least, Hilary uh, is the Common Voice Community Manager from Mozilla and has been such a great friend and in fact, one of our key community reviewers throughout this process. So thank you to all four of you. It is such a pleasure once again to have you with us. I'm going to start with a question to Sneha. Um, and Sneha, you held in many ways the invitation to our friends from across the world to contribute their lived experiences, their embodied experiences online in their language. What did you find were some of the patterns? We've already heard from uh, you know, our incredible panelists before, uh, some of these patterns around orality, around multiple intersectionalities. What has struck you the most about the patterns across these different um, lived experiences, embodied experiences, especially of those who could not be with us today, uh, because of course we had so many different contributions from across the world. Sneha, over to you. Sneha will be speaking in English. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anusia, and hi, everyone. Um, so just um, building on the wonderful work and thoughts um, shared by our collaborators on the previous panel, I think I'd share a couple of points here on what um, stood out for me across across the stories and across the report in general, right? So um, the first is, of course, the point on intersectionalities itself. So as the earlier panel illustrated, the report is about um, so much more than language itself, right? But about how language inequity is located within and uh, further perpetuates various um, asymmetries of power, which then disproportionately affects uh, marginalized non-dominant communities. And these are various asymmetries, various intersections, right? And, and in many layers. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the story by Uda, which uh, talks about challenges of accessing and sharing um, feminist content in Sinhalese. Um, the lack of technological infrastructure, like keyboards in certain languages that affect content creation, and how this can further complicate issues of hate speech, misinformation, gender-based violence online. Um, if you look at, say, Donald's research on declining speakers in uh, Chindali in Malawi, which is a combination of several factors again, right? So such as lack of access, digital literacy, infrastructure, plus um, policy reform on language preservation, revitalization, et cetera. Or um, if you look at Amna's interview series with African and Arab content creators, um, which again offers a very interesting perspective on colonial languages, um, first languages, dialects, um, how does one sort of switch across these? And I think a very interesting perspective again on interlanguage relationships and uh, marginalizations amongst these languages. So needless to say, I think all stories trace back these threads to colonial infrastructures of uh, knowledge production. And I think that that continues to inform this, this discourse and you know, the conversations that we're having on uh, multilinguality. Um, the, the second point I think that stood out for me the most is the, the critical lens that the stories offer to understand digital technologies and uh, their affordances. 
So um, the report outlines challenges and, and there are many as, as we've seen. Um, but the report also opens up, I think, um, a, a great sort of realm of possibility in terms of how flexible and adaptable technologies can potentially be um, if we were to think about it. So despite you know, limited resources, skills. So for instance, there is um, the Mapuche Collective in South America working on a very unique digital pedagogy model um, that is so multi-format. Um, looking at audio, video, image, um, et cetera. The um, Indigimoji project from Australia, which uh, brings Arundi words online in the form of emojis um, and really questions, you know, the whole sort of primacy of um, textual content when it comes to our conversations on language. Um, if you look at the Decolonizing Digital project, um, which is studying how indigenous people of Turtle Island have been using um, Twitter and keyword networks to promote um, learning and survival of their languages. Right? So um, social media, messaging apps, tools, platforms, um, just looking at how our digital ecosystem really has evolved. Uh, but importantly, I think focusing on very embodied experiential ways of engaging with technology. And that has been, I think that is seen across um, all, all stories. So I think for me, these were the sort of key things that, that I would really um, highlight and which stood out for me across, uh, across all the stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sneha, and for just giving us such a beautiful flavor of all the brilliance and richness and textures of the different uh, experiences shared by our contributors from across the world. Um, but we also did some number crunching and uh, I want to share some of that number crunching with everybody now to look across uh, the internet uh, for um, some of the patterns that emerged through Martin's um, sort of uh, data analysis and visualizations, uh, and especially to help us understand exactly as you said, Sneha, what does it look like for tech in the world today when we are fighting in language uh, and in the multilingual internet, the ongoing structures of colonial capitalist systems. So um, over to you, Martin, to walk us through the numbers and patterns that you saw. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, hello, hallule. My name is Martin. I'm a, as, as has been mentioned, I'm a data scientist and digital geographer. This project has been a joy to work on uh, because it's very clear that uh, this is uh, this, this is, involves layers of uh, social justice issues. Uh, so um, we've been overjoyed that we can produce statistics towards these aims that we think are meaningful and that, it, that we think will really help people understand the issue in addition to the stories that we've heard today. Um, as, as we started the report and we tried to investigate what kind of uh, data we could produce to help this project, we started really with this basic observation that we've heard today many times. There are more than 7,000 languages that are in use today, and yet digital platforms don't support those, that number of languages. So one of the key questions for us on the, on the data side was try and understand how many people do we think are affected by this and how many people are potentially excluded in digital spaces based on this? Uh, super, next slide, please. Um, the, um, the, the slides looks uh, like it's slightly wonky where I am, uh, but I think we will, we will be able to get the, the basics. Um, so fundamentally, we, we were trying to understand uh, how do we measure language on the on the internet, and of course that's a that's an impossible task um, because the internet, like the world, is an infinitely complex space with infinitely places with an infinite number of places we can we can look at, and there's an infinite number of questions we might be asking about it. So one of our key challenges is really like what questions, what specific questions do we want to ask, and which in which specific places do we want to look to get a first basic understanding. One thing that emerged in our early discussions is, is uh, that a, a potential first layer of exclusion through language is simply what interfaces, what languages are used for interfaces of these websites. Meaning when we navigate a website or an app, um, 
can we do that in our own language or does the app or the language only speak uh, uh, a language that we might not be able to speak or that might not be our preferred language. So with that as a starting point, we then also identified particular types of online use that we thought would be uh, important to look at in this in, the, in our first survey. Um, and uh, we had many discussions and, and again, there are many options, but ultimately we decided on, on a few key um, uh, thematic areas. One is apps and websites relating to knowledge access like Wikipedia and Google search and others. Uh, one group is around language learning. There are various uh, online platforms that support people in the learning of new languages. And one important aspect was also uh, websites and app relating to communication communication so that's social media that's messaging apps and so on and so we looked at we identified uh, the some of the most widely used platforms across these categories and we asked for each of those are the interfaces of those websites and of those apps uh, available in multiple languages and if so which ones next slide please as, as, a, as a basic summary, I'll show you some detail in a bit, but as a basic summary, we've very much confirmed, the data very much confirmed what we've been hearing so far. On one hand, certain languages are much more widely supported than others. And as has been mentioned, it is particular European languages and European colonial languages that are really well supported across basically all the, all the platforms we've looked at, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese. It is also a particular Asian languages that are very widely supported. Uh, we found uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese among them, uh, 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 Japanese, Korean, um, the, the dominant Indonesian uh, dialects is also, uh, or uh, Indonesian language, Bahasa Indonesian is, is quite widely supported. However, those are not, those don't add up to 7,000 languages. So most languages are really not supported at all. And again, we'll, we'll show examples of that in a bit. Another thing we also found that certain platforms tend to be better than others. Uh, and uh, so we are very happy to say that Wikipedia is, is basically the, uh, the prime example when it comes to language support. Wikipedia today supports on the order of 300 languages and they are constantly growing. No other platform supports as many. Google search and Facebook do quite well. They're more on the order between uh, 100 and 200 languages in, uh, that they support as interface languages. Among the uh, messaging platforms, Signal, Signal Messenger was by far the most, um, uh, had, had by far the most uh, wide ranging language support. But here already we see a significant drop. Signal Messenger supports on the order of 50 to 70 languages, depending on how we, how we uh, measure. And all those are the exception. Most other like, platforms we looked at only support between 10 and 30 languages. Next slide, please. So let's then go back to our initial question, how many people are affected by this? And specifically, um, the question is, um, if uh, 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 how many people might not be able to access a website or an app in their preferred language, but might need to know a second language, maybe a European colonial language, maybe a dominant Asian language in order to access this website or app. Um, it, again, uh, from, a, from a methodological standpoint in terms of how we measure that, it's, it's a complex issue because there's actually not a lot of good data available about uh, how widely languages are spoken. We found data about um, uh, by, by ethnologue about oral language populations, meaning, meaning how many uh, um, people speak particular languages. Uh, however, what we ultimately wanted to know is when we we're talking about websites and apps, people don't speak to an app or, 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 or well, some, some people speak to an app, but often you, uh, it's more a, a kind of textual interface. And there is basically no uh, um, global language survey that gives us a sense of how many people can read particular languages. And there's a subtle difference, but it, it is an important difference. But we, we, we found ways of, of, of producing an estimate and the details are, are in, the, in the report. And based on that, we estimate that just looking at the platforms we looked at, a uh, significant number of people are potentially excluded on these platforms. Uh, um, at least billions of people um, are excluded on these platforms. At the moment, the, the, the estimate is that there are just under 8 billion people alive today. Um, 
if we see on the here on the slide, we see a chart where we have broken out for every platform that we've looked at, starting at the top from Google Maps, Google Search, Wikipedia, and others. We draw a bar estimating how many people are potentially not able to access this app or this website if they don't speak the, the, the supported languages. Um, and at the bottom, you see the, uh, um, the scale for this. Uh, uh, and, and we've drawn a, a, a blue line here, which is a kind of threshold of, the, of half the world's population. And uh, uh, if we, we see, for example, the telegram in the middle of the charts or WeChat just under, underneath very widely used uh, um, messaging platforms. They exclude, we estimate, about half the world's population. About half the world's population needs to be able to speak uh, a second language um, in order to access these platforms. And for many other platforms, it's, uh, we, we found uh, similar outcomes, meaning we estimate on the order of three to five billion people are excluded today on the basis of language on, on these digital platforms. Next slide, please. Here, we are looking at a particular language region to give a bit of more of a, of a concrete example of how some languages might be more widely supported than others. And specifically here, we are looking at South Asian languages. These are uh, languages of, uh, of the Indian uh, 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 subcontinent, as well as uh, Pakistan and, and uh, uh, Afghanistan and, and neighboring uh, countries. Um, we, so we, we have uh, data for a few dozen of the most widely spoken languages in this region. And again, we assessed which of these languages are supported on these platforms. Um, here, we, we see a visualization where the two are put in a relationship, where again, we have on the, on the left, we see the list of platforms starting from Google Maps all the way down. And on the bottom, we have the list of languages of South Asian, widely spoken South Asian languages, um, and where they intersect uh, uh, in, in this grid, uh, we draw a, a green box whenever this particular language is supported by this particular platform um, or a white box if it is not supported. So what you will see on this visualization where we compare the, the dozens of platforms with the dozens of languages, most, language, most South Asian languages that are spoken by many people, hundreds of millions of people are not supported by any of these platforms. There's a lot of whites on this chart. Um, so for South Asian languages are really, and we've heard this before, and, and Bengali uh, was, was mentioned, uh, we, we've highlighted here with, with a blue uh, rectangle. Bengali is really not widely supported as, a, as an interface language on, on these platforms. Um, thank you, next slide please. Um, here we look in particular at African languages. Um, so again, we see on the left the, the list of platforms. At the bottom, we have a list of uh, African languages, again, spoken by many hundreds uh, of millions of people, um, uh, starting with Swahili, Hausa, Yoruba, um, and, and uh, many other languages. Um, here, it looks like we see a lot more green. It looks like African languages are supported by these platforms. However, this is the misleading outcome. And this is where uh, we run into the challenges of measurements that I uh, mentioned briefly earlier. Um, what this really says is um, that our data shows us that these languages are not directly supported by these platforms, but they are supported indirectly in the sense that someone who speaks Swahili or speaks Hausa uh, is most likely able to access a language um, that, that is supported here as an interface language. Um, we, we started looking into the, into, into the data. So uh, uh, this is based on a, on a kind of Unicode uh, uh, matching algorithm that allows us to match data about spoken language to our observation for interfaces, which are in, in written languages. Again, the, the, the details are in the report, but long story short, what we found what this really means is people who speak African languages, who, are, who are, have been raised in Africa, can access these platforms through a, an African colonial language, meaning, or really a European colonial language, um, a language like English, like French. And of course, many Africans speak, first of all, many languages, often it is quite common among African 
uh, 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 speakers to speak multiple languages, and many Africans will speak English, French, uh, and, and other Euro European colonial languages. But I don't think necessarily everybody might agree that uh, uh, English or French are African languages. Uh, historically, they are they have been introduced as colonial languages. So again, long story short, what we see here in principle, we think many people might be able to access these interfaces in the language they speak, but it, again, it might not be their preferred language and it might be a, a European colonial language. Thank you, next slide, please. Um, there's, there are many more details in the report and we don't, have to, we don't have time to go into all the details, but we thought we just wanted to show you one additional aspect that we wanted to look at. Um, we specifically were interested to what extent the same issues also are reflected in the content that is just displayed on websites and not just the interfaces of the websites. Here we see examples of where we investigated uh, Google Maps and specifically we were trying to understand can uh, Google Maps describe the world in your language when you're trying to navigate your neighborhood, your region, can you do that in your language and will the world be described to you in the in the language that you would like to uh, that you would like to use for that in your preferred language. Um, uh, so this is a, a separate study where we identified uh, um, uh, about a dozen languages, and we uh, um, selected uh, a few dozen search terms like uh, uh, just, uh, Google Maps searches for restaurants, for hospitals, for universities, for parks, and for other things, and we translated those search terms into those. Uh, uh, 10 or so languages. And then we executed millions of search queries for different cities around the world to see if I search for things in Kolkata, which is a, a, a large city in India, um, if I search for things in Bengali, or if I search for things in Hindi, or if I search for things in English on the map for Kolkata, how many search results do I get? And we did that here, we, we see the visualization for, for Bengali, Hindi and English in Kolkata. Uh, the second map you see is searched for Swahili and for English in Dar es Salaam, which is a city in Tanzania. And at the bottom, we see searches for the search results for Swahili and English in Nairobi, which is in, in Kenya. And in all three cases, we see there are significant more, so significantly more knowledge available in English than in any of the other local languages. And in all three cases, arguably um, English is, the, is, is, is not necessarily the, um, the, uh, the, the native language. It's, English is, a, is a, historically is a, is a European colonial language in these places. So we would hope that people uh, have choices about the language they can use when they access Google Maps uh, to navigate their cities. But at the moment, it looks like that choice is not necessarily there. Thank you, next slide. As I say, there are many more details that you can see in the report um, and uh, many more aspects of that. But fundamentally, we're, we're seeing that the data very much supports the stories that we've heard today. Um, and, and from my perspective, having done this work, one key takeaway that I can derive from this is I think in order to address these issues, we need to fundamentally reset our expectations. I think currently, uh, the developer of a platform uh, has maybe the expectation that they can add one or two additional languages to their interface and, uh, and that will be an, a significant achievement. I think coming, we, are, we are starting to come from the opposite end of that expectation. And I think we need to fundamentally rethink how we produce interface language support, how, how, how that happens and, and how ambitious that, that is. And I really liked Claudia Soria's uh, phrase earlier, she said, she, we, we need to push the boundaries of translation and of language support. And I think that's that the data very much shows us that really the question is not how do we support one or two more languages? The, the question is, how do we support 7,000 languages um, and make sure that people speaking those 7,000 languages are supported in their online experiences? Um, maybe as a closing statement, we also want to say there are so many different ways of looking at this issue, and these are just some of them. We are also, I think, keenly aware that the first step towards 
uh, improving the situation is to make people aware. And uh, so we are also very, uh, um, very interested in, in seeing other creative approaches to, to capture these issues, be they data-driven or others. Uh, because I think our, uh, there are many concrete steps we can take, but certainly one of them is to increase, increase awareness. Thank you so much. That's it from me. Thank you so much, Martin, for that uh, wonderful um, description. Um, we're staying on in this panel, uh, Shubha, so um, we're going to go to Mandana next. Um, we'll come back to the calls to action for everyone, but um, Martin's uh, data is uh, being made available freely on GitLab as soon as this launch party is over. So just for all the data nerds out there, um, look up the four detailed essays that Martin and Mark have written uh, on the website and uh, dig into the data because there's some, there are some gems uh, there that Martin didn't even get a chance to, to talk about. Um, but I'm going over to Mandana now. And Mandana, you as a linguist, a friend, a co-conspirator on this um, journey of ours, um, you've taught us so much. And we would love to ask you, what excites you most about this report now that we're at this milestone of this launch party? What excites you? How would you like to see the report being used? Mandana, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna delve right into it because there is a lot of exciting dimensions to the report. Um, the first is that it's there. And the first that it's there and that it combines, you know, the combination of people talking about their lives and what it means to them, but also using numbers and visualization to really make clear what the situation is, right? The internet held the promise of democratization to access to knowledge and sharing and contributing. And now this report makes the reality visible in numbers and graphs. And that's one way of presenting information, which is heard by people who may not hear the voices that are speaking in Bangla or Ikan or other minority languages. So it makes things visible on a scale that is really important in order to also have, you know, the political action that needs to take place to work on the, to change the streamlining and minoritization process that we're seeing. It shows that, you know, the web and the tools are dominated by the usual power holders, whether it's political power or economical power. And the fact that you need to have a colonial language or a majority language at the core. To me, the dimension is we really need to make clear, and the report shows this too, is the issue of literacy. So it's not about whether you speak a language or not, it's about whether you read and write a language. You need to be able to read and write a language. And you all know who are multilinguals, you might be able to speak a number of languages, but reading and writing is something that is learned over many, many years. And I wanna raise the awareness also, you know, around, just think about sign language users, right? That don't have a natural way of, re of reading and writing their own language. And it's as if, you know, me, someone tells me, you speak English really well, now write it in Chinese characters. And I would have to learn that entire system. So it's not an easy thing. And just because you speak a language doesn't mean to read and write it. But it also shows that, that it's literacy. So what I want is that the scarcity of data is addressed. And um, Martin and Mark can talk a lot about the difficulty of accessing information. So for example, only half of the countries of this world do a census where they're asking their people in their country, which language do you speak in a way that they would actually find that information. So half of the countries don't even know or don't even want to know which languages are represented because then they can be forced to provide the services in these languages. So there is political action that is underlying providing data and information and numbers so that political powers and policymakers can be brought to bear onto the fact that we're not dealing with a linguistic problem, but a political. And one way I always talk about this is we always talk about languages are dying and whatnot. And 
it's important also to question the our own metaphors that we're using. You know, languages do not die. Speakers are actors in their own right. They're giving them up, they're forced to giving them up. And by abstracting away from them, we don't see that this is a political issue we're dealing with. We're dealing with an issue of marginalization, streamlining and exclusion. And so that needs to be taken into account and we need to question our own ways of dealing with this. And the same is multilinguality is not about a first and a second language. M multilinguals use different languages for different purposes. And they like to use this language for this and that language for that. And the model of having a first, a second and a third language has something to do with the model that is underlying the West and the global North world. But in the majority of the world, multilingualism is a natural thing. Most speak people in the world are multilingual, speak more than one, and they use different languages for different purposes. And that dynamicity is what we need to be represented. The scarcity of data needs to be addressed, and it's with this we need better data so we can put pressure on policymakers and politics. We need to understand that literacy is not the only way. And it's amazing to think about all these creative digital people. You know, why can't you only access the web through writing? And you know, of the 7,000 languages spoken today, maybe you know, a few hundred have a right, I mean, many have a writing system, but that doesn't mean that you know how to write it or they write it at all because often they only write in one language. So people have not learned to read and write. So why has the digital world not developed many, way, many more ways of accessing, providing information and through writing? So this is about multimodality. This is about accessing the web, not only through writing, but through visual means, creative ways of finding and searching things which are not bound to a writing system. So I'm looking for diversity, better data, more data, which makes the issue really visible and brings it to the front and brings it to the table so people cannot ignore it anymore. And I'm looking for diversity in the digital world in terms of language and modalities and also knowledge system, different knowledge system. And I think the report is a major step in really countering the streamlining and to you know support and create a digital world that also reflects our human diversity today and not as part of eradicating it. Thank you so much, Mandela. I mean, two things you said that are so critical, which is to remember that people are languages. Languages yeah. are not an autonomous thing out there, but they are in our bodies, our minds, our souls and hearts. We are languages and that we are dynamic languages. We are multilingual in dynamic ways and we are multimodal in yes. our dynamic multilinguality. And Hillary, this is a wonderful segue to you because you as the Common Voice Community Manager at Mozilla, you have really been at the heart of bringing voice, bringing uh, voice technologies to the multilingual internet we want to see. And so for you, what is your hope for this report and for this multimodal, multilingual, a world that we are all aspiring towards. Over to you, Hilary. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the, invita Ooh, the invitation to um, take part in both reviewing the State of Internet Languages report and taking part in the launch. I think like this report, the hope that it gives is like the, it's very unique in the sense that the stories and the data really embody the experiences of people across the world that navigate the internet in their ancestral languages, both the limitations and also creative ways in which they are like building and forging networks to express themselves um, authentically and within their ancestral languages. Um, so as Anasuya mentioned, I'm part of the Common Voice team and one of the things with the internet is that speech is becoming a, a, an interface in which we navigate the web. So for like virtual assistants to um, like dictation tools, for example, um, and like we don't, um, we're not sometimes relying on text, we're just relying on our voice. And when reading the report in particular, like Mark Martin's work on surveying platforms, um, the data really resonated with me in the way in which it highlighted the billions of people who are um, po like possibly digitally excluded either because they have to rely on like colonial or majority languages within their context 
So one of the quotes that our team like highlights a lot when doing engagements is the fact that one of the world's most popular virtual assistants don't have access to, um, that don't support any African languages, um, in particular Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant. Um, and it's um, important that I highlight the work of our community fellows based in like um, Rwanda, um, East Africa, and in Uganda, who are like mobilizing volunteers across the languages of Kiswahili, Kinyaranda, and Luganda to crowdsource speech data. So speech technology can be more inclusive um, to hopefully create tools um, or creating tools such as like the Embassy chatbot that gives, um, it's a conversational AI chatbot that gives information on COVID-19 um, in the languages of Kinyaranda, French, and English. Um, another aspect I really enjoyed reading about in the platform survey is the ways in which they highlighted the importance of including variants of languages. Um, so like they highlight like the ways in which Arabic, like standard Arabic is um, usually used as um, a default, but Arabic is more than just standard Arabic, it's more diverse than that. Um, so for example, um, how that relates to our project, one of the things that we're like currently developing and releasing soon on our platform is a feature that allows people um, 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 to share and identify their variants. So we've been working with community members to develop this and um, we're working with using the BCP 47, which is a best practice code for like um, describing like variants of languages. Um, and the goal mainly is just to ensure that we can support um, um, support the languages that have a diverse range of speakers and also um, just so that like there isn't just one standard way of speaking a language because ultimately this has an impact on the tools that people use, um, the, the tools that people create and stuff that they create using the Common Voice data set. The last thing I wanted to mention, which I think was really integral to the report and the hope that it gives us like the ways in which it really focused on like the different actions required by different groups. It really recognizes that there isn't one universal actor, but there's various actors within the state of internet languages who have different power and influence, both like be that economical, material or political. I hope folks, including myself in open technology and knowledge can both recognize the power imbalances between organizations and language communities that we send to community consent, respect boundaries, and recognize, the, um, recognize and mitigate around the limitations of technology like we we in ourselves in both like supporting language diversity within technology can't make it seem as if we're like techno solutionists in the sense that like we are now going to stop like languages from being dangerous because it's more than just technology as been highlighted by a previous speaker like it's political it's economic um and yeah um that's all i wanted to say with my time because i worry that i'll speak too much so yeah <laughs> Well, you spoke beautifully and powerfully and to so many of the different aspects that we are, uh, we're talking about and sharing. I know um, it will be felt by all of us. So thank you, Hilary. We could all be talking for so long about these issues because they are so meaningful to each and every one of us, as we've been saying all through. Um, this is us, this is, this is the story of we. But um, in order to bring all of our different participants uh, here by voice, I'm going to move now to the last part, to the closing of this wonderful launch party. Um, and I want uh, my compañera and amiga, uh, Adeli, to take over here. But thank you so much, Hilary. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Mandana. Thank you, Sneha, for bringing these different aspects of the patterns and numbers to our dynamic analysis. Thank you again. Adeli, Amiga, over to you. Adeli will be speaking in Portuguese. Olá, todos. Um, Hello, muito, everyone. Muito, muito obrigada a todas vocês, todos vocês, por, por essa participação, fazerem as histórias, um, os números. Joining um, us today. Thank you todo, for todas as experiências sharing uh, all conosco. of your experience e with de us, é que agora vocês I would like to ask you qual é a ação to think about que você mais de ver what para que se torne the one attribute you would most like to see for a multilingual internet. Então pense, né? Vamos um so, um I want you to think about this for a moment. For a, exatamente, pense um pouco sobre isso. So e, think about e escreva no seu chat, escreva no, no, no chat box. Type your answer in the chat box. 
mas não clique ainda, não mande ainda, não But envie. Do not send it just yet. Hold it there. Eu vou dar só uns dois minutinhos para que vocês possam terminar de escrever. I will give you a couple of minutes to finish writing your answer. E quando eu disser agora, and when I say now, todo mundo vai clicar e vai colocar as, as respostas. Click and send their answers. Ok. Ok. Podemos, podemos ir? Podemos uh, clicar? Go ahead. Please send your answers. Estou vendo as respostas chegando. I see that there are some answers coming in. E a gente pode ler algumas. So, let's read a couple of them. Trazer uma experiência que seja realmente multi... Bring an uh, experience that is truly multimodal. Que a gente tenha multi, a multilingualidade... Uh, seja Multilingualism. Trazendo, trazendo diversidade, que a gente possa that repensar. That diversity, that help us rethink. Repensar os suportes para as linguagens. Support to different languages. E temos mais um, We ajuda. We have a couple of more. Flexibilidade para entender como nós estamos desenvolvendo essas línguas. Flexibility of línguas. allowing it to be developed. Dando a prioridade, dar prioridade para que as linguagens e idiomas that are disproportionately disadvantaged. E muitas outras. As respostas estão chegando. And many others. E I nós see vamos... that there are other answers coming in. Nós vamos ter certeza de divulgar essas respostas. Um... We will disseminate those answers para todos vocês aqui e, of course, and e claro, we will send capturar. It way, and obviously we would like to capture. Acho que vi a última, mais uma resposta. Vocês podem continuar uh, so colocando. One more answer. You can continue sending your answers. E assim, já que a gente está vendo que a maioria das respostas and estão now, aqui, that we are seeing a lot of answers on the moment, chat box. Just to wrap up momento, this moment. Fechar And to close up this lunch party. A gente pode mudar para o próximo slide. We can move Vá, on to favor. the next slide. E também é uma participação. Também gostaria de pedir que para like fechar, assim como again, nós uh, usamos da nossa uma palavra para now that we are using one word to Agora eu gostaria de que vocês pensassem em uma emoção like to ou um sentimento to come up with one emotion or feeling em que vocês estão deixando essa essa festa this hoje. lunch with E nesse exercício a gente não precisa colocar no, no chat, vocês podem escolher uma língua ou type anything on the many, so you can muitas pick línguas, one language or querem. many languages. E a gente vai fazer a mesma coisa like que a gente fez no começo. We Quando eu falar vamos ou agora, today, um, when nós vamos I said now, ligar as nossas câmeras e os nossos microfones um, e dizer essa palavra ou várias palavras that um, que transmitem esse sentimento ou emoção que a gente está deixando nessa festa de lançamento. That emotion or feeling that we have in our minds while living this lunch. Ok? Estamos prontos? Prontas? Are we ready? Estou vendo já as câmeras abrindo as imagens. I see that Abram seus there microfones. are some of you that are enabling your cameras. Please activate your microphones as well. Mais, mais microfones abrindo. I see some other microphones activating. E os, os rostinhos de vocês aparecendo. I see some pretty faces popping up in my screen. E agora, vamos, vamos falar now, a nossa palavra, nosso sentimento, nossa emoção. 
speak up okay, our emotional feeling. Go ahead now. I'm inspired. Inspiration. Enthusiasm. Joy. Joy. Pronto? Todos os sentimentos e That emoções. Muito, muito obrigada. Well, ah, thank um, you so much. Com, essa, com esse exercício lindo thank de ouvir todos so vocês. Thank you so much for um, in this exercise. Quero agradecer a todos. So cool. uh, I super, want e porque, to uh, se a gente pode mudar para o próximo um, slide. Can we um, move on alguns, to the next slide, please? Alguns, Uh, algumas uh, lembretes que eu gostaria de deixar é que nós vamos estar, claro, uh, trazendo mais Obviously, desse evento, mais do relatório nas nossas redes sociais. Um, por favor, visitem o site do relatório. Um, se tiverem event, perguntas, por favor, não um, deixem de nos mandar essas perguntas. Um, e nós vamos away. fazer questão de responder And essas perguntas nas nossas redes sociais. E antes de ir, a gente quer, um, mais uma vez, repassar o vídeo, então a gente again, vai assistir o vídeo novamente, mas antes de começar o vídeo, muito obrigada a todos, especialmente aos nossos um, like intérpretes e, tra e, tra e tradutores que fizeram esse evento realmente possível um, e multilingual. Obrigado multilingual event. Thank you so much. Conheci bahasa internet. Relatório do estado dos idiomas da internet. Informe sobre o estado das línguas na internet. The state of the internet's languages. In particular, we have been considering how indigenous peoples from across and beyond Turtle Island, colonially called Canada, the United States. Coran Kondisi Bahasa Internet. The estado dos idiomas. Informe sobre el estado de las lenguas en Internet. The state of the Internet's languages. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Shukran. Obrigada. Obrigada. Merci. Thank you so much. Gracias.